A certificate of rehabilitation is a declaration by the court, if it's granted, if your petition is granted, that you are rehabilitated. Now, to start off with, there are five things you should probably know about a certificate of rehabilitation. And this will help you in terms of deciding whether or not this is something for you. But for those who are anticipating the tiered registry, this also bleeds into that process. And it's helpful for understanding how they're going to decide whether or not to grant your petition if you have to petition and if that petition is opposed. First of all, um, if you were convicted of a felony or misdemeanor sex offense and are not otherwise ineligible, you may apply for a certificate of rehabilitation and that's Penal Code 4852.06. Rather than go through that, let's talk about who, who is ineligible. Okay, and to go to who is ineligible, we go to 4852.01 subsection C. That's Penal Code 4852.01.C. Just remember 4852.01. Now, when you get there, you'll see that it says in print, any violation of section 6, or 269, subdivision C, section 286, section 288, Subdivision C of Section 288A, sub, or Section 288.5, Section 288.7, or Subdivision J of Section 289. Now, that's quite a few, quite a few convictions that causes you to be ineligible. So right there, you know, no need to apply. That's the first thing you should know about the statute itself. And that is, if you're convicted of, or not if you're convicted, but if you're either on probation or parole. Additionally, if you were granted probation, in order to qualify for a certificate of rehabilitation, you need a dismissal under 1203.4. So before you even go to the statute I just said, which is 4852, which is the, the certificate of rehabilitation statute, if you were granted probation, the first place you go to is 1203.4. And there you will find that there are exceptions. Uh, for those who are, who are able to apply for a dismissal. Those who cannot apply for a dismissal are 311.1, again, Penal Code 311.1, Penal Code 311.2, Penal Code 311.3, or 311.11, or any felony conviction pursuant to D of subsection 261.5. Okay, those are in addition to what you would find in the other statute I just said. Now, if you have one of those that you can't, that's right, you can't. As of 2014, the legislature changed the law, the dismissal law, and added those to its list. Now, let me explain something to you. That's not the end all, because there are exceptions to that. Okay? When you can't apply for it, or you can't apply for it before you end up probation? Uh -oh. Okay. The first statute I, I talked about was the, was the ineligibility under the, the statute, the certificate statute. The second one is if you're granted probation, you need a dismissal before you can apply. And the, co and, and the convictions I just, I just stated, those since 2014 are added on to the ones that were already existing in the code, okay? And for those ones that I just read off, yeah, okay? Those are, those, those, are, those are in effect since 2014. However, there's a case called People v. Arata, okay? And it's a 2007 case. And that case is most helpful in, in achieving a dismissal if you, if you were convicted of, of any one of those convictions I said just a moment ago before 2014. And the case basically says that, that was part of your deal and that they should grant the dismissal anyways. Okay, and, and so that's, that's, that's the first thing you should know. What about was that case, I'm sorry? Huh? What was that case? That was, that was, People v. Arata, that's A-R-A-T-A, and it's a 2007 case, 151 Cal App 4th, 778. It's an interesting case to, to read. Do you have all this written down somewhere? Uh, I do, and we're probably going to post it on our website so you don't have to be precise. I will, I will get the hand, instead of making a handout and getting it to everyone, I think what we'll just do is take the, the, the handout, shorten all this, and just have it posted on our website, and that way everybody will have equal access to it. I just want to underscore what Chance was saying, 
and that is what he when he talks about 1203.4 of the penal code, he's talking about people who have received probation. So people who were sentenced to prison, or now what we call community prison or county prison or penal code section 1170H, we're not talking about that when we talk about penal code section 1203.4. In order to qualify for 1203.4, which is we usually refer to as the expungement statute, that is something that is available to those people who receive probation. So he's going to move on to certificates of rehabilitation, which apply to the other people. But when, when we talk about 1203.4, it's, it's limited. It's limited. But you have to understand that if, if you want a certificate and you're granted probation, you won't, you won't be eligible for a certificate unless you get a dismissal. Why is that? Because you have to show that you performed on probation in order to be eligible to get that 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 ultimate that, that uh, certificate. So, and if you if you don't make that hurdle, you're on for life. So understand that. Yes. Sir, do you know how long after probation ends if you fall into that category that you can apply for this? Immediately. 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 The day after it's over, either terminated early or expires. As long as you performed and you 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 uh, made it through your probationary period without violation, this this should be a slam dunk. Violation without once again being reinstated, and you have no open cases, and you have no new cases that you are facing charges on. So you cannot apply for 1203.4 relief while you have an open case or some other case that you are uh, you're you're fighting. Correct. That does not sorry, that does not affect the registry. That is just it, it, no. it's 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 yes. That's for 1203.4. May I you don't if you if you as Chan said it if you've completed your probation and you don't have anything else open, you can literally file the next day. And when you are on probation of course you do have the option of asking uh, the court to terminate your probation early and once off probation, then you're eligible to, to go for 1203.4 relief. Let me uh, regurgitate this a bit without code section. The certificate of rehab process in California treats 290 registrants three ways. First way is absolutely barred, can't even file a petition, you're out of luck as to a certificate of rehab. Your only recourse would be the traditional or straight pardon application directly to the governor. Okay? That's one category. That's one subset. Second subset is allowed to petition for a certificate of rehab, but doesn't get off the record, off the uh, register, even after getting the certificate of rehab. And that certificate of rehab is then transmitted to the governor's office by the court, where it becomes an application for a pardon. The third category or subset <clears throat> is those 290 registrants who not only get the certificate of rehab, if it works out that way, but they get off the register as a result of getting the certificate of rehab. They don't have to go to the governor and get a pardon to get off the register. Does that clear anything up? To which sections? The this is all handled in, in the code between 4852.01 and 4852.22 and it implicates a couple other code sections, namely 290.5, that's a very important one, and as Chance has said, 1203.4 of the Penal Code as well. Not to, men not to uh, omit section 290 itself. But we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. We're, we're, we're just on the, the first thing you need to know. <laughs> so, let's, let's move on to the second thing you need to know. There are certain periods of time to wait between the time you were released from custody or discharged from probation or parole before you can apply for the certificate. And that's under Penal Code 485203. And typically that's either seven or 10 years, depending on what the conviction was for. Okay, so waiting period is the second thing to know. So when does that start? Well, that starts either after you're released from custody or you finished your term. And that's how that generally works. Uh, for parole people, that's when you're discharged from parole. I'm sorry, wrong. 
That's either when you were, that's when you were released from, I, I think in parole, in terms of parole, I think we go from when you were released from custody. When you um, walk out of the yeah. joint. When you walk out of the joint. In, in probation terms, this is, this is where it gets a little funky, because uh, if you got probation and you didn't do any custody time, then it starts at the end of your probationary term. But if you, and, and this is interesting because when, when a person does even two hours of custody, okay, which is a day, you get credit for a day plus good time work time, that's two days. Most people, you know, most, most lawyers think when they're, when they're resolving these things, that doesn't matter. Okay, and we, let's not even talk about the time you did because it was nothing and we don't, we don't want to show any custody time. Wrong, 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 wrong. You do want to show custody time, even if it was a day, because that's when the clock starts ticking towards your ultimate relief time. And so if you're doing a disposition and you were arrested and you were detained for two hours, you want your lawyer to make sure that the court gives you credit for at least one day. And if not, and you get five years probation, then the clock starts ticking if you've got zero credits at the time you're, you're, you finish your probationary period. And if that lasts for five years, then ultimately you're going to wait 15 years until you can apply rather than the, the time that you actually should wait, which is about a 10, 7 to 10 period, or a 7 to 10 year period. So that's what you need to know about the waiting period. Now, if you're, I'm sorry? Yes? My understanding is probation is federal and parole is uh, state. I, I know someone who can answer your question. <laughs> We have probation both on the federal side and the state side. People get probation all the time on the state side. And with respect for parole, it's become somewhat confusing in California because, again, when we got AB 109, which was the change of what we called our realignment to try and get the population down in California, we now have these people under 1170H, which are the nonviolent non-serious offenses who are do doing local prison time. So they're doing what used to be a prison sentence, but they're doing it in the community. When those people get off, they will be under a short period of supervision under the probation department. When people get probation, they will be under perhaps supervision from the probation department. <coughs> talking about stateside now, because we're talking about California law. And if a person goes to prison and is released on parole, now we have two different tiers of that. One is the traditional parole for certain people that the uh, Board of Prison Terms continues to have responsibility for, and others are being supervised in the community by probation. And when you have violations now for those people and for the 1170Hs and for people who are on probation, revocations are handled by the Superior Court. You have a right to an attorney. You have a right to a hearing in court. When you have individuals, that, that limited number now, who are on parole through the state parole system under the Board of Prison Terms, those individuals are still going to be heard in the what we used to call the administrative process by the board, by hearing officers, uh, and those individuals are are their cases are heard usually at prisons. So there's different groups of people, but okay. yes, we do have probation on the state side. Okay, and, and as a certificate of rehabilitation, does that apply to federal? No, no. Probation? If no. All, everything that has been mentioned are statutes within the California Penal Code, and they relate to people in the state of California who have applied under our state law. And let's be really clear about that. Okay, so as, as, as Alex said, it's a state remedy only. It doesn't apply to federal cases, and it doesn't apply to out-of-state registrants, people who have been convicted in states outside of California who are now residing and, and, registering in California. It's a California remedy. And it's, it's a jurisdictional remedy. You know, if the jurisdiction is here, you got convicted here in the state court, and we're talking about a certificate of rehabilitation, it's a state remedy. Now, let me oh, can I just sure. add one more point to that, and that is there is no such remedy anymore on the federal side. 
Nothing like 1203.4 expungement on the federal side, it doesn't exist. Nothing like certificates of rehabilitation on the federal side doesn't exist. The only thing that exists on the federal side is a presidential pardon. But other than that, forget it. Uh, hopefully one day the feds will once again bring back something like that, but there is no avenue available on the federal side right now. Um, don't give up on the federal pardon process. I got one from President Obama uh, regarding the drug case. Uh, the petition was pending for three years, and uh, I knew it was meritorious when I started working on it. But uh, that process is there. The, the federal pardon process is there for you. I have a heartbreaking case I'm going to start working on of a 30-year-old uh, Army commander, uh, company commander that did 186 bomb disposal missions and then cracked and uh, slipped into uh, what amounts to uh, peeping Tom activity, voyeurism, sort of addicted to it and uh, got himself court-martialed and wants to move to uh, Los Gatos. So he's got uh, some kind of weird federal conviction. I'm going to be looking at the records Monday, tomorrow, uh, yeah, Monday. Um, did you want to finish your yeah, presentation? Uh, yeah, so okay. okay. So we've covered three points. <laughs> All right, let's, let's take the fourth thing to remember. If your petition is successful, the court shall declare you rehabilitated, and that's where we started. It's a declaration of rehabilitation. And uh, you will be relieved of the duty to register. However, if it, you know, this will not apply if you were convicted of one of the, the offenses in Penal Code Section 290.5. And I'm not going to read you the whole list, but I'll give you just some of them. Uh, uh, for instance, a 264.1 is not relieved even though you got a certificate. Section 266 provided that the offense is a felony. So obviously, that's a wobbler. It could be a misdemeanor or a felony. If it's a felony, you don't get relieved. If it's a misdemeanor, you do get relieved. Uh, uh, section 266 provided the offense is a felony. Um, and it goes on. And you can look at that section, it's Penal Code Section 290.5, and it lists everything. And it also says the attempted commission of any of the offenses specified in this paragraph. Why is that important? There is a famous case out there, and it's, it's the Lewis case. And the Lewis case says that although you can't get a dismissal for a 288A, because you're not eligible for it if you're on probation, and if you were released from prison, you can't get relief because you're barred from it by 4852, okay? So this brave individual fought this because he had uh, attempted crimes. And the court decided that, you know what? You still can get a dismissal because it was an attempted crime or an incomplete crime, okay? So here in this section, Mr. Lewis was eligible for a certificate of rehabilitation because he achieved his dismissal, but he still cannot get a certificate of rehabilitation because it says, under you, attempted commission of any of the offenses specified in this paragraph. You've got to read Penal Code Section 290.5 very closely. Now, someone approached me before we started and they said, well, what is, what is, you know, is this a good place here? I mean, does this really apply to me? And I said, well, part of this may because of the tiered system. And let me give you an example of how this works out. Although Mr. Lewis got his certificate of rehabilitation, and although he's not relieved and it becomes an automatic request for pardon, I have to tell you, I've never heard of a pardon granted in this state for any sex case ever. And I'd be enlightened if anybody can tell me who and when. But I will tell you this, this is a very interesting thing in the toolbox for us lawyers. Why? Because if Mr. Lewis goes to court under a tiered system and he gets opposition and he has to go to a hearing in the same court he got his certificate in, which he would, it's going to be pretty hard to argue that Mr. Lewis is a threat to the community after the same court declared him and certified him rehabilitated. That's what's so important about the statute. And I want to point that out because that is, that is where, on this road, this journey to relief, post-conviction relief, lawyers can be creative and, and can have effect on these statutes. 
okay? And it's where you can do it by living up to these standards and going to court. And even if you can't achieve relief, if, if it is possible to get a certificate, uh, I, would, I would recommend you do so. Now, the last thing you need to know before I hand it over is that if a, in terms of a certificate of rehabilitation, it is not ingrained in stone once you get it. It's not permanent. It's dynamic. And let me explain to you what I mean by dynamic. If the Superior Court finds that a person who has received a certificate of rehabilitation presents a continuing threat to minors of committing any of the offenses specified in 290, the court shall rescind the certificate. Rescind means revocation, means take away, means you're back on the list. That is Penal Code 4852.13, subsection C. What does that mean? That means that if a prosecutor thinks by information they've gained in some way, because the standard there is a preponderance of the evidence, a very low standard, okay? They think that you pose a threat, they can go back to court, petition the court to rescind the certificate, and you have to go back on the registry. Okay, that, that it's, 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 it, it is really a strange part of the section, but it is there, meaning that you can lose what you've gained. Now, I don't see that language in the tiered statute, but I see the idea of being a threat in the tiered statute. And that's what I talk about when we've had this discussion about the tiered statute. Only instead of being a threat to minors of committing any offenses in Section 290, it's the general threat of, of being a threat to the community. So, but understand that that could happen. So what that really means is, is that there's cause to rescind that thing. It's certainly, it's, it's certainly open to be rescinded. Now with that, I'm gonna hand it over uh, to uh, Mr. Mullins and he's gonna discuss uh, a little more in depth the practical aspects of the certificate. Hi, I'm Jerry Mullins. I've been practicing criminal defense for 40 years, mostly out of San Jose. I started out in the District of Columbia. Um, about 15 years ago, I decided I was so interested in record clearing that I'd like to specialize in that and that's pretty much what I've been doing. Uh, I'm very interested in the certificate rehab process and today I thought that what I would do is give you at least one thing uh, that you could take with you to improve your situation. And when I use the word you, I'm speaking to you as a prospective petitioner. Um, and so the thing I've given you in your seats is a form application, VCIA 8016, it's the Department of Justice form probably generated out of the uh, Department of uh, Parole Hearings, used to be called the uh, Department of uh, Prison Terms. And uh, this is the form you use with live scan fingerprinting. Um, several years ago, uh, the Department of Justice thought it was a good idea for a lot of stations in California to be able to take your fingerprints electronically, transmit them to Sacramento, and then you would receive your statewide criminal history record in the mail. They're doing very well. My clients are getting their rap sheets, as they're called, RAP, Record of Arrest and Prosecution. They're getting them back from the Department of Justice in a matter of days, less than a week. So uh, this is a good move to, uh, to take. Uh, Los Angeles County is a little bit different than many of the other counties. Uh, I think there was a decision made that the Sheriff's Department would not purchase the life scan machines. So you have all these private commercial outfits in, in Los Angeles County offering the service. I don't recommend it. I recommend that you submit this application um, uh, through law enforcement. Go to a police department or a sheriff's department and get it done there. And the reason I say that is that there's been some abuse coming out of the private sector with people using your first very sensitive information and selling it online. You've probably heard about that. Uh, so stay away from those people. Uh, go across the county line if necessary to a sheriff's department that is doing it. You can look these up on the web. Usually it's by appointment only. Small fee of about $25, something on that order. And if you want to get your FBI record, at the same time, you'd have to go through the procedure of getting the fingerprints done the old-fashioned way with the cards. Uh, the second item I've got for you is a little book published by the California Court Association. Now, earlier in an earlier workshop, you took, we brought up the subject of old records, court records, and so forth. 
Okay, well this little directory has all the telephone numbers and addresses, uh, fax numbers and so forth of all the co uh, courts in California. Its price is $30 and this is a one year old uh, version of it. I, I get it every year to stay up with it because court buildings change their addresses and so forth. To get your old records, you're going to have to go through the court of conviction. They will probably tell you, well, that's in archives. Mm -hmm. And then you have to go to the archives, the state archives, and this is a whole other process. And then perhaps they will tell you, well, we destroyed those long ago. Yeah, could that could be your answer. Okay. But give it a try. See if you can dig up these records. Get yourself a copy of this. You can actually pay for it on the web. Pardon me? What is it called? The California Court Association Directory and Fee Schedule. Okay? Now, I'll talk about some more forms. When you get your state of California statewide criminal history record, you are now prepared to communicate with attorneys, legal aid, public defender, whatever, uh, about your record. And this is very important in the area of uh, offenses that trigger the 290 registration requirement. For example, there is a code section of 288. It's one of the most punitive code sections in the, in the whole code. And it has a subdivision A, which is in parentheses. This is confused with another section, 288, lowercase a. So you want to get, when you talk to an attorney and enjoy the attorney-client privilege and the confidentiality, you want to be able to say, well, here's my record. Because you don't want to be on the phone saying, well, I think it was 288 or 286, I don't know, you know, forget that kind of conversation. It's a waste of time. Okay, so once you've set up with your statewide criminal history record and you have not been lured into buying or subjecting yourself to a local one, which isn't really going to do you any good, you say, well, yes, I was convicted in Los Angeles County 15 years ago. I know my record. No, 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 no. There are a couple of reasons why you want your statewide record. For one thing, it contains a number, an identifier, called the CII number. Criminal Identification and in, in, criminal, criminal Identification Index, I think it means. Okay? And you're going to need that number to put on your petition when you petition for a cer Certificate of Rehab. Now, the Certificate of Rehab uh, packet <coughs> consists of five forms, which you can download from the website of the Superior Court. Forms consist of a, the petition, uh, and a notice of hearing, and, a, uh, and of course the certificate form itself with the judge will sign. And then two proof of service, proof of service by mail and proof of service by personal service. Well you say, well who's gonna serve these things? Well there are people out there making a living as uh, uh, process servers. They usually hang around the small claims court because that's, you need that there, okay? And you get these, and, and anyone over the age of 18 in California can do this, but you want to get somebody that's got some credibility. Then you want the proof of service back that you've served the DA at each county that you were convicted in, okay? So that you can hold it in your hand and say, service has been <coughs> affected, okay? Now, do I like these forms? No. I'll give you a war story. I was filing a petition packet in Alameda County, and the clerk said, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, of course, I'm very proud of my petition packet. It's all customized to my client. Right? No, no, no. He says, you've got to do it on the uh, Department of Justice forms. I said, no, yeah. It's not the law. Oh, he said, but the uh, Board of Parole hearings has bounced a couple of our certificates. I said, you mean after the court granted it, they sent it back? He said, yes. And they insist on using their, their own forms. Okay, so I had to fill out the forms in, by hand and hand them over. Now, I mentioned one reason why these forms are to be used. Um, and as, and I, I alluded to the fact I don't like them. One of the flaws in the forms is it doesn't anticipate misdemeanor 290 registrants applying for a certificate of rehab. The forms all talk about felonies. Most recent felony, second most recent felony, so forth. There's no mention of misdemeanor sex offenses in the forms. So they have to be modified, because you don't want a certificate of rehab 
going to the governor's office that says you were convicted of a felony uh, on one occasion when you weren't convicted of a felony at all. You're convicted of a misdemeanor sex offense. Okay? So these are my thoughts on the basics. You can get started tomorrow at finding or digging up your records and taking a look at these forms. Go to the website of Amador County Superior Court or Monterey, Monterey Counties and get the complete set of five forms. Look them over, start figuring out what you need to put in them. And though, we'll get into the meat of this uh, workshop in just a second, but when you get your petition filled out properly, you want to back it up because you bear the burden of proof. You want to back it up and support it with evidentiary stuff. Everything but the kitchen sink. Well, what do I mean by that? And maybe if you installed your own kitchen sink, maybe you could take some photos or video. Anything that shows that your post-conviction life was productive and constructive and you took corrective action with regard to the conduct that got you in trouble in the first place. Okay? And speaking of buzzwords on that uh, application for statewide criminal history record, you want, the buzzword you want to get out there is uh, record review, and I think this form actually uses the term. Uh, that's a police term, and that means you're not applying for your criminal history record because you want an adoption or you've got an employment opportunity or something like that. It's clear that you're going to talk to your lawyer about your record, and that's what you're saying. That's it. Okay. So, so as was mentioned, uh, there are certain specific forms and there are certain packets. Uh, I practice in, in San Diego, uh, and our court has a specific packet that can be picked up at the clerk's office or it's online. And I think um, there are many other counties that have these forms online. So you can go online and see exactly what they have and what they say and what's required. Uh, there is no fee for filing for this. Uh, in many of the counties, the public defender's office has a unit that will assist people in doing it. In San Diego County, we actually have a paralegal that works for the district attorney's office. And when you have the information ready, she will take a look at it and basically screen it to make sure that you are, uh, that you qualify. And again, there's no charge for that. When she ch checks it though, that doesn't mean that that's the end of it if she says you're not eligible. It just means that for some reason she finds a problem with it and you can uh, then, she'll give you the, the reason for it and then you can follow up and, and hopefully find that her reason was erroneous. So uh, again, there, there are ways to, to get this done um, and to have availability to these forms and, and information uh, which are not difficult. And I, again, I'm, I'm speaking for our county, but uh, it helps a great deal when the district attorney's office paralegal has made a decision that you qualify because once they've made that, that call, then they clear it to be put on the calendar in our court. And we have a particular judge, he happens to be the longest sitting Superior Court judge in San Diego County, and they all go to him. And so when the district attorney's office has basically given a green light or approval to this and it gets put on calendar, uh, that goes a long way in getting relief. Now, I have to agree with what Chance said and what Jerry said. Uh, obviously, the more material you can get uh, to support your petition, the better it is. So you shouldn't just say, well, the DA's office doesn't see a problem with that. That doesn't mean that some judge or some other district attorney at the hearing is going to raise something. So you should get your packet together as, as best you can. Now, I'll just read to you the things that they say that a certificate of rehabilitation does and what it does not do, because sometimes there's confusion here. So, as was mentioned, it does relieve some, some sex offenders from a duty to register in the future. And as Chance indicated, there's unfortunately a whole bunch of 
sections that this does not apply to, but some people do get relief. <coughs> it enhances a felon's potential for licensing consideration by a state board. So for future employment, individuals who, for instance, are applying to be a real estate agent or an individual who is trying to get uh, a, some type of uh, CPA or uh, accounting uh, license or something of that nature. Certificates of re rehabilitation are key in, in, in trying to get relief there. It serves as an official document to demonstrate a felon's rehabilitation which could enhance employment possibilities and was, as has been mentioned by chance, we hope, tiered registry bill goes through, enhance the opportunity to get relief uh, in getting off the registry. And finally, it serves as an automatic application for a governor's part, as has been mentioned. So you, you, you cleared that hurdle. What does it not do? It doesn't erase the felony conviction or seal the criminal record. That Penal Code Section 1203.4 section that we were talking about earlier, that is an expungement section. So if you get relief under Penal Code Section 1203.4, that does remove <coughs> the conviction. Okay? But certificates of rehabilitation do not remove the conviction nor seal the criminal record. It does not prevent the offense from being considered as a prior conviction if the person is later convicted of a new offense. So you can be prior. And that actually is true with 1203.4 as well. It allows a felon to answer on employment applications that he or she has no record of conviction. No. That's what 1203.4 does. It does not for certificates of rehabilitation. And within 1203.4, it specifically indicates that it is supposed to be there to allow you to avoid the penalties of having been a prior convicted felon. But that's not true for certificates of rehabilitation. With respect to giving felons a right to vote, the right is automatically restored in California after discharge from parole. Obviously, under 1203.4, you remove the, the felony, you have the right to vote, and you have the right to serve on a jury as well. And finally, it, restore, it does not restore the right to own or possess firearms. Obviously, an individual who uh, is a convicted felon in the state of California does not have that right. So the, the other uh, point that I just want to talk about is the fact that it does require, and Chance uh, touched on this, it requires a continued residency within the state of California. So you have to be here. The problem is what happens if you leave the state and go someplace else? That's going to impact your ability to get certificates of rehabilitation. You can't do that and apply. It, it cuts or tolls the amount of time that you need in order to apply. So if you leave the state and then come back, basically the clock is going to start all over again. And you have to pass that test. That's one of the things that the district attorney's office looks at in determining whether or not you're, you qualify. So they're going to look to see your continuous residency within the state. And then we touched on this a little bit. When you take a look at the form, there are various places. You may be, for instance, living in Los Angeles County, but your convictions are out of San Diego County. So how do you deal with that? And how do you, how do you make sure that you get real appropriate relief? And also, it usually requires that there be some type of letter from the law enforcement agency that is supervising your area of residency to verify that you have complied with the law, that you, you've been good. So in addition to what was mentioned about getting your, your um, information from the California Department of Justice that verifies that you have not picked up any new crimes, that you've been crime free, uh, that you've been a good citizen, uh, you need to also provide evidence 
from the local law enforcement agency where you're living, that supports your petition as well. And then I, I think we can talk uh, some more about the types of letters, uh, but obviously anything that can uh, enhance your rehabilitation, the fact that you have contributed to the community, any volunteer work, any type of work that you have done to help your community, anything that you have done on the job, if you can give specifics as to how you helped other individuals uh, become uh, employed and, and, and successful in their jobs, uh, what you have done in your community to uh, ba basically have people uh, give you references. And so uh, the, the three points that you want to cover are, number one, who is this person? How long have they known you? Uh, what is their relationship to you? Number two, uh, anything, <coughs> and hopefully anything specifically, that, that verifies, underscores, supports the fact that you are a good person, that you are a, a good community member. Uh, and finally, the fact that they, as a, a citizen of the community for so long and an upstanding member of, of society, support your uh, request for a certificate of rehabilitation. Um, Let me add that you, of course, you want to cover the subject of recovery from uh, substance abuse. If alcoholism or drug addiction was uh, in the picture at the time of the offense, you want to leave a paper trail and then put that paper trail together to support your petition and, of uh, recovery. And I, I, I can't remember now whether we talked about mental health support uh, not yet for this too, but obviously uh, as part of your packet, as part of your advocacy would be uh, a support from the, the someone, uh, a mental health professional who supports uh, your petition and, and basically indicates that you are not a danger to the community, that you uh, uh, in effect, uh, if you needed to be rehabilitated, uh, that you are uh, and that you have basically done all these different steps. Uh, again, talking about the people with, with substance abuse, uh, that you continue to be involved in AA or NA, and that's a, a double part too, that you, you know, maybe you're a sponsor for someone now. Uh, so not only have you continued in treatment and in abstinence, but you also have helped others. So, I mean, there's a series of things that play off on that, but again, it, it should be common sense. Think about anything possible that would make a person say, you know, this person is a fine, upstanding member of our community and is worthy of, of getting this certificate. Now, now, why is that important? And that's because all of us are kind of talking towards a, a point of, uh, the most important aspect of a certificate of rehabilitation, which is you must leave a law abiding life. And this is this is why they call it post conviction relief. From the, from the time you're convicted until the time you get into court, you make your compelling presentation that you have lived a law abiding life, you must have lived it. And and that's where the real focus is. And that's that's really where the rubber meets the road. And so what they're talking about is one, um, establishing when he says paper trail or when he says uh, that you need things that substantiate what you're doing, what you're really doing is corroborating your claim that you've lived up to the standard and that you should be recognized as leading a law by your life. Now, what does that really require? You can't come in there and say that because the courts look upon you and they say anybody can walk in and say anything they want. It requires one, that you do it and two, a degree of transparency so other people can take note and record it. You understand the difference? The thing is, is that if you decide to live under a rock for 10 years, it ain't going to do you any good. You, you, you've got to be able to express to the court, not through just what you say, but what others say about you in terms of your evolution and in terms of your, your, your discourse with society during the 10-year period. And so 
what you need to do is you need along the way to document your efforts through others. And that's essential because, for instance, I cover Los Angeles as one of my jurisdictions. And Los Angeles doesn't have forms that you can get on the internet. You gotta go down to the Superior Court and they hand you these forms. And if you look at them, they're not even the DOJ forms. They're, they, they, they are the cruddiest, ugliest looking things you've ever seen because there's only one judge and one prosecutor and one court for the entire LA jurisdiction. That means if you were convicted in Pasadena or Long Beach or San Fernando or Norwalk, you have to go to Department 100. And you have to go to the second floor of, of the Fultz building on Temple, and that's where they have these documents, and they were put together by the DA, and he just threw together a bunch of stuff. If you look at it, 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 it doesn't even make sense. I don't, I don't use it. I don't use it to file the petition, but I do use it to satisfy the prosecutor. I've had a relationship with him for like over 20 years. And I fill those out myself after I do my petitions, and I give him the petition plus what he wants. And he calls that his application, and he gives it to his process, or his investigators, and that's what they work on. But you have to understand that, and every jurisdiction is different. Uh, Jerry works in jurisdictions that are very different than the ones that Alex works in, and very different than Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, unlike San Diego, where if the paralegal gives you the stamp of, of, of good to go, you're good to go. But in Los Angeles, it's different. In Los Angeles, you have to deal with the district attorney. And the idea and goal is, is that you create a petition and a compelling case, like Alex says. You have to have a compelling case. And if he does a non-opposition to it, if he doesn't oppose on the record at your hearing, you stand a real good chance of getting that thing granted by the judge sitting there, depending who the judge is. Um, and one time there was a former U.S. attorney, and, and it didn't really make a difference whether there was opposition or not. But the last few years, we've had some really good judges in Los Angeles. So, excuse me, are you yeah. saying the documents are specific to each jurisdiction? You can't use the Alameda County packet or documents for the LA County? Yeah, let me just clarify that. Yeah. Los Angeles is a unique jurisdiction, and there are others kind of like it. The state, in general, has, has forms, and they're created by the Department of Corrections, and you can get them online. And those are, those are the general forms accepted. However, some jurisdictions, jurisdictions require something a little bit more. And so you have to go to the clerk in the court where you're going to file. And it came up, where do I file? I mean, I got convicted in Bakersfield, but I live in Los Angeles. You apply in the county you reside in. But you've got to invite Bakersfield to the party. And by the way, you've got to invite the governor to the party. Now, they're not going to show up unless it was really, really something that they think is egregious and they need to make a statement on. I've only had him show up once, and that was in Modesto. But I can tell you that most of the time they don't show. But you got to invite them anyways, and the law requires that you got to show that you did invite them, which means if you do mail service, a return on your mail service. But again, every county is different, and so it depends on you know it depends on the jurisdiction you're in and, and, and what the local courts are doing. But the forms are universal. Put it this way: you can do it your way or you can do it my way, or you can do it the clerk's way. Guess who wins? <laughs> so in LA, in LA County, you're not going to be going back to your judge or your court if it's going to be different court. I'm sorry? He's, he's asking County you whether you're going, going back to the, court, court. the judge of your conviction or not. No. You're not, not unless you live in the same jurisdiction that you were convicted in. Oh, yeah. And you're not going back to the same judge, no. Uh, well, let me qualify that. If you're in Los Angeles, you're not. In Los Angeles, you're going to Department 100 and whoever's in Department 100 because Los Angeles is set up to handle them a certain way. And in San Diego, they have a judge and they have, they have their own setup that handles these things. And other jurisdictions, you know, like for instance, in let's just say San Bernardino, <coughs> It may be just the court that the clerk selects you to go to. Okay, that, that's the way they use them. Or there's only one judge, like Lassen County or, or whatever, uh, one rural judge. And he, it's something to see these uh, single judge courts operate or handle a criminal case and a probate case and a divorce. And it's, it's like, where'd they get this Superman? <laughs> and I'll, I'll give you a, and, and, then there, and then there are twists, like for instance, in Sacramento, 
it's set up identically to San Diego, and you've got to you've got to speak with the paralegal. And if the paralegal says go, everything's good to go. <coughs> However, in San Francisco, they actually have a committee who the DA's office has a committee who looks at these things and decides by committee whether or not they approve it. That's strange. And so what happens is you go in for your first court date, and then the case is put over for the committee to consider it, and then the DA comes back with the committee's answer. And if the committee says yes, they not oppose. They may even they may even say they may even support it. Uh, and that's that's a twist. But every jurisdiction is different. So in LA, in terms of the judge, in terms of the district attorney, is it a different district attorney that may have been involved in your case, or do they have to involve the one that was in your case? Yes. If if if, if you if if you had a, a uh, assigned district attorney, and chances are if you were convicted of the sex crime, you did. That may not be who, who you see in court. There's only been one who's been handling this for years and years and years. His name is Tom. And he handles all these for the whole county. And it's before now Judge Gordon, who is a very, very good judge. He's a very fair judge. So LA is happening right now. It's a good place. And I, I, I want to mention one other thing, and that is the we didn't talk about what happens if you get turned down. Obviously, there is an avenue to have it revisited again, but there's also the ability to appeal. So um, abuse of discretion is the, the legal terminology. So you have a, and these aren't easy anyway, but you have the laboring or being able to prove that the, the judge abused discretion in denying you relief, but there is an ability to go up. Going back to something Mr. Chan said earlier with 311.1 and trying to get the certificate of implementation. If you get a plea in 2014, is there any obligation of the DA to tell your attorney that you can't um, get it expunged anymore? Like in other words, if you didn't know that like you were planning on getting, getting expunged in three years, but you had no knowledge of it until now, in 2017, because of 1820, is there any obligation on the DA to tell your attorney you didn't know about that? Well, the, the, well I, I think that the, the easy answer is that the, they have no obligation to inform your attorney about anything. Uh, your attorney should know what the state of the law is at the time you do your disposition. And I, I think what you're, you're getting at is, can you blow the plea for ineffective assistance of counsel? Is it something that was a, what we call a knowing and intelligent waiver of your rights? Uh, and it, of course, you carry the burden on that. And remember, uh, if you unring the bell, you could go from the frying pan into the fire. So uh, just removing the conviction sometimes can lead you into something worse. So you have to weigh all of those things. It's a very serious decision to make. But I think that with the, the United States Supreme Court case in Padilla versus Kentucky, which kind of says that defense attorneys have a responsibility to tell their clients about immigration consequences. Similar situation here. And most of the, um, most of the, the change of plea forms in the state, as far as I know, have a specific section which informs people of their responsibility to register, but, uh, and, and they may have a box that says other ramifications, but uh, you raise obviously an issue that, that might be important. And the second half of that question is, since it didn't come in until August the 13th, if your case was started and you weren't charged in 2014, <coughs> it started in 2013, is there any kind of grandfathering um, with that? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. different laws, they have different kind of well, grandfathering that, well, you know, if you if you have a specific case in mind, see us after or you know ask us, but let's just put it this way. That law came into effect January of 14. If your conviction happened before January of 14, then you've got a great case, Colorado. And I, 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 at first, I didn't know whether or not that was going to be a good case, but I can tell you now, it's it, it's successful in every in every court I've brought it up in. Uh, it's a good case. It's a great case, and and you're you're in pretty good shape there. If you were convicted after January 1st of 2014, uh, the legislation is what it is. So you got started in 13, you got convicted in 14. Well, I'll talk to you guys after this. Yeah. Thanks.
Other questions? Yes. I just have a statement that I'm comparing this with parole. If you try to get a parole, you do your due diligence and you have one time before that person can make some paperwork. And you better have all your ducks in order the first time as to revisit it again is harder. You mean for the I mean, to get a parole hearing, you have to have all your stuff. Well, so you're talking about you have all your stuff. Are you um, talking about a LIFER hearing or a LIFER parole hearing? Or it's just a 602? Or, or what are you talking about, parole well, hearing? I was talking about somebody who is incarcerated and not out on parole. Okay. Right, but you have to do tons of paperwork and have all kinds of support. <clears throat> so you're saying in this, this certificate of rehabilitation, you better do everything you can do and have it all together. Right. You go yeah. the first time. Absolutely. But I. But I, I still am not sure what you're saying because in California, again, we have a determinate sentencing law. And so if the individual is, is convicted of, of something and sent to prison for a determinate amount of time, they're going to get out on parole. If they get a indeterminate life sentence, then they have to go to the board to get out. My so, experience is out of state. Okay, well, so I'm okay. assuming we don't. Yeah. We're just dealing we're with from, California. Right, so we're a state contract, so we don't. I consider for a certificate of rehabilitation here. Excuse me. I'd like to thank everybody for this conference. I've learned as much as I've given, I think. It's been a quite an experience as a student as well as a speaker. And I have to leave immediately to catch the last plane out of Burbank to San Jose. So if anybody's driving there and would like to give me a ride, you will have a rolling initial office conference. <laughs> There we go, we've got to take her. Here, I'm going to give you this directory. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, that, that, we'll, we'll still take questions. We'll, we'll we still do that. Yeah, so, yeah, Alex and I will remain for the last 50 minutes and answer questions. So, okay, we have another question. Thank you. Okay, next question is, yes. No, we're, we're, are we still, did we finish that? Her question, because I was saying that Yeah, you, well, okay, so she was talking about interstate compact. Okay, and, 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 the, and, that is a, and that is a complex question. And so, depending on what went into that, depends on what the answer is. Can't answer it here, because we don't have all the facts. So, if you want to ask us individually, uh, we can certainly handle that. But, yeah, we're not going to do any individual cases. Uh, other question, yes. Uh, two questions later. I'm curious, what, what is the origin of the Certificate for Rehabilitation Law? Because obviously it, seems it, it is a law that appears to me to provide some relief from the burdens of the, of the registry. So I presume it, was, it came some time afterwards in response to complaints that the, that the, the registry was too draconian or something. No, 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 no. no. It, it, it's, it, it, it's not just for the registry. It, it's, it's for all crimes, all, and, and, and it was focused on just felonies, really. And really, the, the initial focus was just felony, you know, just felony crimes. Never, didn't, didn't pertain to misdemeanors, just felonies. Uh, however, um, it expanded with the recognition of misdemeanor sex crimes. That, those, those are the only misdemeanors that are considered in certificates, by the way. Um, otherwise, it has to be a felony. And the focus, the focus was on post-conviction relief and cleanup for people who had been convicted of felonies. Oh, I see. It's yeah. not specific but, sex crimes at all. No, no, absolutely not. Oh. But it's been around since 1943, is the answer to your oh. question. Oh. And it does apply to all felony offenses. Uh, so it, 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 it doesn't just focus on sex crimes, but the area where there's a problem is that there are certain sex crimes that can't get re re certificates of rehabilitation. So that's something that maybe in the future can be amended, but right now there is a distinction. Is that and other, it, other felonies as well? Are all kinds of other felonies not, not sex crimes? Yes. That are not? That are not uh... No, no, no. The, the sex crimes are specifically called out. There are, there are actually, I think there is actually uh, there's some, some other non-sex crimes that you can't get a certificate for, but most other crimes you can. But the, the bottom line is that uh, it also was created as being 
separate and apart from the expungement proceeding for those individuals uh, who want to get a pardon. And so they created this as a first step and a hurdle that you have to make before you then seek the, gover the governor's pardon. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, we have a, uh, yes. Yeah. Just to clarify, something you guys said earlier. Um, so, 290, um, as it pertains to 290, out of state or federal offenses, they compare what the criminal <coughs> law is and say, for example, 2001, 311.11 was a misdemeanor. <coughs> There's no way for someone that was convicted of that federal offense to get a certificate of rehabilitation. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Let me let me see see if I understand it. For people who have been convicted <laughs> out of state, right, or people who have been convicted on the federal level, the certificates don't apply to them. It's just a state remedy. It's not a state remedy for other states. In other words, if you're convicted of another state and you come in our state and you register, your your original jurisdiction is where the conviction happened. Okay. okay, so it doesn't cover cover out of state folks. Perfect. And two, federal is a different jurisdiction. It's not if you if you are convicted of a federal crime, you're subject to our requirements for registry because there's no federal registry. But but this isn't your original jurisdiction. The federal court's your original jurisdiction and they have no remedy. Your life means life in the federal system. So yeah. Okay, so then the second question is, it, it is not obtainable, even if, because the tiered registry there, you said, well, you could use it to try to... No, 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 wait, wait, wait. We're not, we're not going to the tiered registry. But we're just talking about right? the California post-conviction relief remedy of a certificate of rehabilitation. And, what I, and, and so, I know you want to make the connection. No, don't do that. Because the tiered system is a proposal, and, and, and it's in process. And we really won't even know what that will be until October, really, fully written. But this remedy is not available to people who have been convicted federally, nor for people who register in this state with out-of-state convictions. That, that's how to understand this. Okay. Thank you. Um, if you are granted a certificate uh, a relief from registering and the disclosure on the website, when, when, when you are relieved from registration, there is no website. You're, you're done. Okay. But let me, let me just say something about that too. Because you're done in your state, if your state is California. I know you were going to ask the second part. But you're done in your state. But let's just say, for instance, that you want to move to another state. And that state has an equivalent law in the books. Okay, so let's just say child form, 311-11A. You're relieved in this state, so you no longer register here. You're not subject to Megan's. You're not subject to, to being posted. Nothing. You're, you're done. So you're living, you're living in California, registration free, and you're fine. You want to move. If that state has a law, and almost every state, including the federal jurisdiction, has a law about child porn. If they have an equivalent law, that state may, I say may, a lot of states do, require you to register even though you're off the register in, uh, registry in California, and they don't recognize post-conviction remedies in California because their rationale is, why should California tell us how to protect our own citizens? So what it is is, is, is they use it to keep out-of-state registrants, whether they register or not, from coming into their state. That's the barrier they put up. It is the same thing that applies to visiting that state? No. So no. Depending, depending on whether or not you're on the registry or you're off the registry. If you're off the registry, you can visit. If you decide to reside in a state, you're going to have to look at their particular requirements. But you can't visit without, without registering. Feel free to roam. Yeah. But you have to be careful about what each state requires as to how long you can stay before you have to register. Maybe be careful about that. Yesterday you talked about Las Vegas, but if you went there over 48 hours and had to register, if you had a certificate here and you went to Las Vegas, are you going to have to register after 48 hours? No. No, if you're visiting, it's different. If you want to reside, yeah, let's, just say, let's just say you were convicted of, uh, let's just say, sex with a minor. In California, that's that that, and let's just say that the person you were involved with was 18, or I'm sorry, 17, and you wanted to move to Nevada. The age of consent in Nevada is 16. So would you be be required to register if you want to live in Nevada? Probably not. 
because that's not illegal in Nevada. However, if you were convicted of child porn in California and you got off the registry and you moved to Nevada, they have a law in the books, I'm sure, every, every jurisdiction does now, and they're gonna require you to register if you move to their state. If you visit their state, no, no, no. Is that, what do you think about that, Alice? Is that yeah, right? I agree. Except, like I said, you need to read specifically what that state's requirements yeah, are. You, you really do. Yeah, because each state is different. Wow. Um, what if you have a long, interesting rap sheet and you have, say, a felony and several misdemeanors, one of which is um, you've got a, you're registered for, and you're applying for a certificate of rehab on that? Does the rest of your rap sheet kind of flavor? I mean, what you're doing is only applying for a certificate of rehabilitation regarding the misdemeanor of registered registered misdemeanor. What, what impact does the rest of the rap sheet have in terms of how that's perceived? Well, they look at, I mean, we've, we've tried to emphasize that they look at the big picture and that they have access. You're dealing with district attorney's offices uh, that have access to the complete rap sheet. And so I would expect that, um, depending on what community you're in and and what your opposition is, that they may raise those types of things because they may be relevant to whether or not you are a danger to the community. So I, I think it, it's wise to anticipate that, uh, to certainly not hide anything like that, uh, and to be open, but also to be able to address why you are rehabilitated, not just on the one, but on all. So go to the whole world. Right, exactly, right. Mr. Cox? On a 1203.4, that's an expungement of your felony. Yeah. Well, can't you can't own firearms then after that. No, because the, the code section, the penal code, 1203.4, specifically excludes a few things. And one of the things that they exclude is the ability for an individual who is a convicted felon to have a, a firearm. So the, the code specifically eliminates it, just like it has three things that you have to you have to say that you do have the felony even if you have, if you're asked on an application to run for state office, if you happen to want to run for state office, if you are applying for a state license, so if you want to be a lawyer or doctor, or anything that requires a state license, you have to put that down. And the last one, which I always find interesting, is if you want to apply for a job with the state lottery, you have to put that down. <laughs> That's so, important. So again, under 1203.4, the code section specifically lists those things as something that you have to do, even though the code section elsewhere says it's to alleviate you from having any type of ramifications from this felony. One of the things it says is as a convicted felon, you cannot possess, possess a firearm even if you get 1203.4 relief. No, no. Antique uh, firearms, right? No, 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 no. no. Fire Elections? Firearm. If it's Don't operable. Go there. Yeah. <laughs> Do not go there. Yeah. <laughs> Don't <laughs> mess with that. One day you have you, a, a ball, what do they call it? A, a, <coughs> a, a flintlock. Yeah. Flint, a flintlock. Don't go there. Don't go there. One thing you should know, though, is some, some folks are, are convicted of what we call wobblers, which are felonies that can be reduced to misdemeanors. If your felony is uh, reduced to a misdemeanor, and if the proper language is used in the court, and that's really important, okay, when you're first sentenced, you have to be properly sentenced by the court in order to get this remedy, okay? Because if you're sentenced to a suspended sentence, even though you get it reduced to a misdemeanor, the character of your conviction is still a prison sentence, it will still be considered a felony, and you cannot own a firearm. However, if, if it's not a suspended prison sentence, but just simply a suspended sentence, and you reduce to a misdemeanor, you can restore your gun right. So there's, there's certain ways to do this, and you know, I know it's hard in retrospect to look at you and say, oh, what did I do? But it's, it's, it's important from the get-go to make sure that everything is done properly in terms of what's gonna happen in the future, especially in the area of sex crimes. So understand that, and that's, that's a whole different talk altogether. This is a certificate of rehabilitation, and that, that goes off into another, another universe, but 
Yes. If you're able to get off probation early, will that be more helpful to you in receiving a dismissal and later certificate? Well, first of all, if you get off early, you're almost almost assured of getting dismissal because no one's going to let you off of probation early unless you perform exceptionally. So that's that's easy enough. I always think that it's it's everything you can do to advance your cause, and I think that Alex touched on this early termination of probation, reductions, anything you can get in the courts to show or mitigate the seriousness, the seriousness of your case helps ultimately when you get to the rehabilitative state, when you get into a petition and you show an evolution, make, you know, soft that you have bettered yourself, you've bettered your family, you've bettered your neighbors and friends, and, who, and, and you, you've done community service, and you know, you've taken care of the issue that caused you to fall in the first place, and, all these other things, and that's what we call the kitchen sink. Anything you can show that, 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 that establishes a compelling case for the court to say, yeah, you know what, you, you've led a law-abiding life and you make a compelling case here for us to grant this petition. On the flip side, if you apply for early termination and the judge just isn't interested just because they don't do that, will that hurt your case? No, no, no. not at all. No, and I think we're, we're getting to that time, it's 3.30, and we could probably go on for a lot longer. I want to thank you. Thank you.